Thanksgiving. I hope you're going to have a really good one. Today we continue in this Psalms of Ascents section of the Psalms that we began last week with Psalm 121. Or Psalm 120. Psalm 120 being a very short Psalm, 121 is not much longer, uh, not quite as short as 120. But the same type thing. We, we always begin with a question, and so I, I'm going to ask you a question this morning that probably will require you some personal assessment, some personal thinking, some personal meditation concerning the nature of this question, and it comes right from this psalm. And that question is, how have you yourself experienced both the diligence as well as the vigilance of God in your life. I don't know, we might have to we might have to define those words before we can answer the question. Of course the vigilance is that uh, is vigilance means always there and always steady at it. Diligence means working hard. So how have you experienced those in uh, those aspects of God in your life? And you might think about that and meditate on that. Because this psalm does. One thing that we will try to point out as we work our way through this Psalms of Ascents section in the book of Psalms, and remember this goes all the way to uh, Psalm 134, and that is its, uh, its meaning specifically, yes, for the Jews, uh, but also how does it tie into uh, other passages in 
the Old Testament or the Jewish Bible. And one thing we'll be particularly looking for is how does it connect with what is known as the priestly psalm in Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 and 25, which if you remember uh, is something I typically close uh, our time together with as we're studying, uh, and how that kind of wraps, wraps it up for the Jews and, and maybe even for, this, for the, a psalm. So that's kind of where we'll, we'll be looking today. So we always start, uh, start our psalms with dividing it into a couple of pieces. Uh, for this one, I started out just dividing it into uh, two sections, verses 1 and 2, and then verses 3 through 8. But I'm going to divide it into verses 1 and 2, 3 through 7, and then 8 by itself. So verses 1, and they all speak about Yahweh, Jehovah, in some aspect of, of Yahweh. For example, verses 1 and 2 speak to Yahweh as creator. And then verses 3 through 7 speak to Yahweh as protector. And in my Bible, you can, <laughs> you can notice one word that's repeated over and over again in that section, and you'll see it too probably in your Bible. And then verse 8 is Yahweh, the diligent, the vigilant. Yahweh, the diligent, the vigilant. And so that's the way it's divided up. And I want you to remember number six, chapter six, verses 24 and 25. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you. The Lord give you peace. And see in this psalm where it touches that priestly blessing. So, if you have your Bibles open to Psalm 121, let's read it together. In the first couple of lines of the psalm, ought to be familiar to you if you've sung the song, I lift up my eyes to the hills. And where does my help come from? Because that's the way it starts. It's a song of ascents. We'll talk some more about that in just a moment, but remember some of these psalms, like the next one, 122, will say a psalm, a song of the sense of David. And so someone attributes 20, 122 to David. This one is just a generic uh, subscription, but who knows, maybe it was David's too. Uh, but it just, it just wasn't uh, subscribed that way. So, a psalm of ascents, Psalm 121, verse 1. I will lift up my eyes to the hills, and from where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. It really ought to feel pretty good when we read that psalm because of one word that's <laughs> repeated quite often, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But, but it just says so much about Yahweh and, and what he's all about when it comes to you and me. And as the psalm closes, and that's the way it's going to be forever. And that's the way it's going to be. And so let's start one again, once again with this idea about a song of ascent. 
Some have proposed this. There's 15 of these Psalms of Ascents from 121 to 134. And some compare that to how many steps there were in the second temple, Herod's temple, how many steps there were from the court of women to the court of Israel, and there were 15. And some have suggested that these were the psalms that were sung as people ascended, a song of ascents, ascended those steps. Maybe they, they did Psalm 121 at the first step and then Psalm 122 at the second step, maybe. Or maybe they just would just sing them all. And when they got to the top step, they would they could look through, you might say, the door of the temple all the way back to the, the most holy place, the holy of holies. And, and there is such significance there for not being a priest. Of course, they couldn't leave that court and go into, go into the temple. And so maybe that's it. Maybe it was songs being sung as the people, the worshipers, you might say, ascended those 15 steps into the court of Israel. Only where the Jews could go. So the first item in this psalm then is, is acknowledging Jesus Christ, I'm sorry, acknowledging God as creator who made heaven and earth. We're not going to turn back to Genesis 1, okay, and read all that, but he did. He did exactly that. Uh, he created those heavens in, on day two and the rest of the place. He, he said, uh, Spirit of God moved across the face of the deep, and God said, let there be light, and he began to organize the earth on that first day. So he's maker of heavens and earth, and that's a, that's a phrase that's repeated over and over again, most of the time referring to all of God's creation, all of it. And so that's what the psalmist does here. And so in, in a very specific way, in a very specific way, he says, I lift up my eyes to the hills, and that makes us think of so many hills and mountains that showed the presence and the power of God, does it not? Of course, Mount Ararat is where the, uh, where the ark came to rest, but you had Mount Sinai where God, God delivered and spoke to Moses and delivered what we know as the, the Ten Commandments and the Ten Commandment law that went along with that. Uh, we have a hill called Golgotha, right? And, uh, and so many other hills and so the psalmist says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. And when you think about it, is it, would it not be true that the mountains in, a, in maybe the most powerful way there is demonstrate the power and the, and the creative ability of God? Whether you go to Colorado or you go to the Alps or, or wherever you go, the mountains, the glorious mountains show strength. And they show majesty and they show power. And so the psalmist here, David, if you please, says, I, I lift up my eyes there because that, that reminds me, that reminds me of the creator. Yahweh as, as creator. So I, I lift up my eyes to the hills from where my help comes. And then he realizes, well, the reason that it can come from is looking at the hills is because God made them. And they are an example of God's creation. Okay, God's creation. God, God is creator. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth, which would include those mountains. And so creation ought to inspire something in us. You know, we're, uh, we're entering this period of Thanksgiving. I guess Thanksgiving is just a couple of weeks away. And so we're entering this period we call Thanksgiving, and we're, we're emphasizing, I guess I should say, we're emphasizing this, uh, this idea of being thankful. Being thankful, and uh, maybe sometimes we, we forget that. We, just, we, we forget just, just how to be thankful, or not just how, we just forget thankfulness altogether. I remember years and years ago, my oldest daughter, Melissa, uh, asked me this question on the Sunday after Thanksgiving. 
uh, one year. She said, is Thanksgiving over? And without thinking, <laughs> I said, uh, yeah. Well, I had to retract that. I had to help her understand we're always, we're always to be thankful. Okay? Always. And an observance of God's creation can, can exude thankfulness. You know, in Romans chapter 1, we find the Gentiles uh, described as observing the creation, but not worshiping the creator. They should have, in their observation of the created world, realized there was a creator and worshiped him. And instead, they worshiped the creation. In other words, they became idolatrous. And in all of that description of the people, the Gentiles, it says they, they, they neither honored nor thanked God. The very things they should have done if indeed they were observing creation for what it was. The handiwork of God. And so the psalmist says, I go to the hills, that's my help comes from the Lord, and he made it all. How his, his mind just expands from the idea of the hills to everything. That he made the heavens and the earth. Yahweh as creator. Because of that, then the, the psalmist can go ahead here in Psalm 121 and give us some aspects of God. So many of them, so many of them driven by the word keep. Either keep or keeps. And in verse 5, it just simply says, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your keeper. You go to verse 3, he will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. This, <laughs> this takes care of that diligence and vigilance of God that we opened up with that question. God doesn't fall asleep on us. He doesn't fall asleep and all of a sudden becomes unaware of what's happening to us and what's going on in our lives. But yet he's very much on top of things. And with this word keep, then that, that should bring to mind to us that first phrase of the priestly blessing from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. And you could put those two things together because the fact that the Lord keeps you is a blessing. But the Lord, because the Lord keeps us, he has blessings for us. You know, it takes me to the 23rd Psalm. He makes me lie down in green by still waters and the green pastures and and he restores my soul. And all that's said about God as our shepherd. Similar things being said about Jesus as our shepherd in John. That he keeps us. Let's emphasize the keeping for a moment uh, in, in this psalm. Okay, we read that he who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. Okay, the Lord is, is your shade on your right hand. The Lord will not strike you by day, nor the sun will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forward. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And so as you see, as verses 1 and 2 talk about Yahweh as creator, and our observance of creation then leads us to the acknowledgement, verses 3 through 7, that, the, that Yahweh is also our protector. He keeps us safe. There may be some kind of misunderstanding here that if, if indeed we're, we're faithful to God, if we have, if we have given our lives to, to him through Jesus Christ being baptized, to have our sins washed away and to be given a brand new life. The greatest do-over there is, is when one becomes a Christian. Living now in the kingdom 
the kingdom of God by Jesus Christ, then all of a sudden all of our problems are going to go away and we're not going to have any troubles or issues. And that's not, what, that's not what he's saying here and that's never taught in the Bible. As a matter of fact, Jesus will say the, almost the exact opposite. In this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So we're serving the one who has overcome the world. And he is the one that, that keeps us. And so in some of our distress and in some of our issues and troubles, the Lord is still diligent, vigilant, and diligent. I'm going to get those words mixed up before this is over. He's both vigilant and diligent. And so he keeps us. He says, the sun will not strike you by day nor the moon by night. Well, the sun's not going to quit shining, okay, nor is the moon, okay, but the it says here that he shades on, the Lord is your shade on your right hand. If you need relief from the, the heat of the troubles uh, of the world, you'll find that with the Lord. And we, we need to, we need to understand this meaning, I guess, of the right hand, uh, because remember, Jesus is now seated at the right hand of God. That's a place of recognition. And this means that, that, that God is seeing us. God, God is, is recognizing us. And he does bring us protection, just as the good shepherd there in John brings protection for, for his sheep. He doesn't, he, he doesn't make the wolf go away, but he protects the sheep from the wolves. And so that protection is there. And the Lord will keep you from all evil. That's what he's all about. That's what he's all about. We, ha we, uh, we do commit evil from time to time. And you know the way the Lord helps us there? He sent his son Jesus to die for us. And so when you, when you become a Christian, experiencing what I've, what I've called the greatest do-over that there is, okay, then, then all that evil is wiped away and you begin to live your life in service to this creator and Jesus Christ, and we're going to slip up every now and then. And we need to understand that that blood that cleansed you initially is still at work in your lives. If you're walking in the light as he is in the light, John says in 1 John 1, then the blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses you from all sin because God understands. God understands that even when we when we submit to him uh, through his son, Jesus Christ, that we're going to have our moments, our moments of unfaithfulness, our moments of disobedience. When thing, when Satan maybe gets just a little bit of hold on, on us, we say things we shouldn't have said. We do things we shouldn't have done. And, and our, our conscience, our conscience is seared. We know that we did wrong and we just really turn around and say, I'm sorry, Father, I'll try not to do that again. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us because we're still walking in the light. And so the Lord will keep you from all evil. He's done that by, for us through Jesus Christ who keeps us from experiencing the results of sin, which is death, punishment. He will keep your life. And, and his vigilance and diligence shows up in the last verse. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. You know, depending on when this, when this psalm was written, it could be looking back on all the times that God's people rebelled, that they, they disobeyed God, and they were punished for, for that. And he's saying, you know, from, from now on, I'm telling you what you should have already known, that God has always been, been with you, even in those in those desperate times and in even in the times when when he brought his punishment to you he's from this time forth and forever he is with you and so that's uh, that answers the question maybe that we ask at the very beginning god is with you even in those desperate times i might need to point out to you that god is with you in the good times but maybe sometimes we forget that and that things are going so smoothly in life, maybe we almost kind of park God in the back of our mind somewhere and say, I'll come back to you when I need you. No, he's there 
He's there all the time, good and bad times forevermore. And when the forevermores are over, in other words, when Jesus returns, there you've got it. The ultimate presence of God displayed in your life by his diligence and his vigilance. God doesn't forget or overlook you. He doesn't sleep through the things you're going through. He understands and knows and he works in his way in your life, which may not be necessarily our way. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you. And may the Lord grant you peace. Glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. Glory, glory, Lord. You are the mighty God. You are the mighty God.